After another rough start for Max Reed, many quest- fans are questioning what's going on with the Braves' ace, somebody especially needed with Spencer Strider gone. I'm going to answer that question and many other fun questions that we have for you on today's Mailbag Podcast, so let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, where we talk about your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on social media at Shortstop Ball. Follow the podcast at Locked On underscore Braves. Subscribe on YouTube if you are new. Hit that thumbs up button. If you're listening on the audio version, make sure that you give me a five-star review there as well. If you would, if you enjoyed the podcast, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all your support here. At a locked on Braves, I want to give a shout out to some of the everydayers who commented recently. We got Gabriel Garcia from Brazil who's listening every day, Coleman Snell, Killmanful from Chicago, and Ryan Webb. Thank you so much for letting me know that you are everydayers here at Locked On Braves. If you are an everydayer, please give me a shout out down in the comment section below on YouTube. It is our weekly mailbag podcast. We got a lot of really fun questions to get to, as we always do on the mailbag episode, but a lot of them talking about Max Fried and his struggles to begin the season, what's going on there. We'll dive into that discussion and many other more questions that we have for you. Before we do, though, I want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side to me, and it is a big reason because of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, it is our mailbag episode. I'm not... I'm not going to address Wednesday's game specifically. It's been over 24 hours since that game ended. You want more on that game recap, go listen to the postcast in your Lockdown Braves audio feed or on Lockdown Sports Atlanta. You can hear me and Grant McCauley break everything down from that start. But I do want to get into Max Freed because we got several questions here, about three or four questions about Max Freed. First one comes from Leland Hurt, who says, what's going on with Max? Walks, home runs, and hits. Not his calling cards previously, so are we looking at mechanical problems or am I needlessly worrying and he will settle in? I I hope it's just mechanical problems. I hope it's not anything injury-related, but certainly the walks, four walks for Max Fried on Wednesday, not typical to what we're seeing. The hits are something that will happen with Max Fried. There are games where he'll give up six, seven hits because he gives up a lot of weak contact. He's not a strikeout pitcher. So he's going to give up some contact, and every now and then those balls are going to find a spot in the outfield. They're going to trickle through the infield, but it's typically not a lot of loud hits. It's not, you know, not a lot of home runs, as you mentioned. And the the home run to Alvarez, that is the only park in all of major leagues that that ball would have gone out of. That would have been a pop fly in every other stadium. Now, to be fair, it was a 94 mile per hour fastball middle up. It wasn't a great location. Alvarez is very strong, but It's not even like that pitch was squared up entirely. But either way, the hits, sometimes Max Fried can give those up just because he is a pitch-to-contact pitcher. But when you add the walks into that is where things really get into trouble. And I think if you want to take something positive out of at least these last two starts from Max Fried, I I said it after the Marlins start, I wasn't quite convinced that he was all the way back. I thought that might have been more indicative of the Marlins lineup. I didn't, it didn't seem to me, and I went back and watched it a second time, that he had great feel and command for his pitches. And it was even worse on Wednesday, where he just basically had nothing. And the fact that he had nothing, and he was just able to get through five innings, only allowing th- three earned runs against that Astros lineup, which I get it, maybe they're struggling a little bit at the moment, so catching them at a good time. I thought that was a minor, minor miracle for Max Freed. And I think that also goes to show you just how good the stuff still is that even when he doesn't have it, he can still get weak contact and get outs and give you a chance to win. Next question from Nancy says, I'm worried about Max now. He has not pitched well, and last year his forearm strain kept him out for a good portion of the year. I'm wondering if it is bothering him again. I don't believe free agency is on his mind. What are your thoughts? And congrats on 10,000. Well deserved. Well, thank you so much for that. And yes, we did get over 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, so thank you all for that. This is something for me, the forearm strain that Max Fried had last year. I think we all kind of forget about it a little bit. We all think about the blisters at the end of the year, blisters he's had throughout his career. But that forearm strain, 
I mean, that can lead to major issues for any pitcher. And to just hear the word forearm, forearm strain, anything like that should make you hyper aware. Now, nothing's been said that Max Fried is, is injured or that that is bothering him. You know, if it is, he's going to want to try to fight through that as much as he can in a contract year. The last thing that a pitcher wants is to have major forearm shoulder surgery going into a contract year. Now, I don't think Max Reed would continue to pitch at the detriment of the team, and I'm not saying this is the case at all, but that is in the back of my mind a little bit as we're seeing this slow start for Max Freed and seeing him struggle with command, which is not something that he typically struggles with, at least not for essentially four outings. I'm, I'm counting the Marlins start in this because, as I said, even though it was good and he pitched well in that game and got a, le- a lot of weak contact, I think it was more indicative of the lineup he was facing rather than what I saw, which just still just wasn't great command of his pitches. And I do have the forearm injury in the back of my mind. And now I do wonder if that is causing him some issues. Again, nothing has been said about that. And there is no indication that that is the case, but it is in the back of my mind. Hopefully it's not. And like I said, in response to Leland's question, I hope it's just a mechanical issue that he's off a little bit right now. Maybe he was overthrowing a little bit. Maybe he had some pressure on him early on to get off to a good start. There's certainly pressure on him now. With Spencer Strider out, you cannot lose Spencer Strider and then have Max Freed backslide and or get hurt. So you're going to need him at the top of the rotation. But for me, now I'll read one more question here and then I'll give my final thoughts on Max Freed. Nicholas Petrilli says, if he continues his wildness on the mound and high ERA, it's Max Freed playing himself into an Alex Anthopoulos friendly type of contract. I almost hope he is an average pitcher this year so we can resign him. I mean... I want him to be good because I want the Braves to win a World Series. But look, if he is injured or if he does, you know, have a down year, perhaps that does open up the door for him to sign a one year deal or sign one of those deals like Jordan Montgomery or Blake Snell had to to kind of reestablish himself. There, There is certainly that possibility. I think that could happen. My hope right now for Max Fried and what I'm seeing is just that it is a, a little tweak, a mechanical tweak that he needs to make to get that command back. Everything I see from the pitches say that nothing's really changed. The velocity, 94, 95. We've seen them pump it up even higher than that. I will say the the inches of drop, looking at Baseball Savant on his four seam, is, is down a good bit from where it has been, or at least where it was last year. But curveball still has good movement on it. it. The horizontal break on it is down about an inch, but nothing too significant. But most of his pitches, I mean, just eye tests would tell you that there's still really good movement on those pitches. He just doesn't have great command of where they're going he's not getting ahead in counts and it's not allowing him to you know put hitters away with that good breaking stuff and everything that he has so again for me when I watch him pitch it's more just command issues it's not anything with his pitches it's not anything with his pitch movement it really just is command and you can see that it's visibly frustrating Max Freed I do think that he will figure it out and start pitching more like himself but but we're four starts in now. I don't think it's I don't think it's crazy to at least have a reaction at this point to what we've seen from Max Freed, but it is early in the season and there's still plenty of time for him to to turn things around. Look, he lowered his ERA on Wednesday from eight and a half to seven and a half. But I do think Max Freed will get back on track. But uh, it is, you know, a little concerning right now with just because of where the rotation is. Already missing Spencer Strider. I have serious concerns about Charlie Morton, as I discussed after his last start. And now one of your aces is having some command issues. So that does worry me in some regard, just because of the status of the starting rotation. You have to have Max Freed pitching like Max Freed. I want to believe that's the case. I think that will be the case, but certainly need to see him turn a corner here in his next start or two to get that back. All right. That is our Max Freed portion of the podcast. May have a couple of more questions come up about that, but. We do have a lot of great other questions to discuss, including uh, including MLB storylines going on right now, including Marcelo Zuna. Should they extend him, Orlando Arcia, and his st- hot start, and so many other questions. We'll get to all of those here next. My wife and I started looking for life insurance several years ago when we started having kids, and the process was just super stressful. 
I, I wish we would have known about Policy Genius at the time. They are the country's leading online insurance marketplace, saving you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 a year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help you walk through it. Talk to a team of award winning agents who will walk you through the process step by step. Easily compare quotes from America's top insurance or ins insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Check life insurance off your to do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. We've all been there, whether as a player, as a fan, it's halftime. Scoreboard's not looking too good for the home team. You're feeling a bit low, not sure if your team can pull out the win. That's when you just got to dig deep, lift your head, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. I'm talking about the smash hit mobile game, Monopoly Go. It lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's a monopoly you love, but on your phone and anytime you want to play. They have tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress. Play on countless dynamic monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. That sounds like a lot of fun. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So back, get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. You watching Fox Sports, ESPN on your TV all day, just got it running in the background, and you're constantly having to turn the volume down or even mute it because of all the shouting that's going on over there, the shouting matches they get into about nothing. Make the switch today to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring the biggest stories without all that screaming. And you can get it now streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, on Friday, my interview that I was going to have with Bryce there has fallen through, so I'm looking for a backup. If not, We'll have something great for you on Friday, and then we'll pick things back up on Monday with our minor league segment and recapping the series with the Rangers. But let's jump back into our list of questions here because we got a lot of great ones still to get through. Next one comes from Jay Rowe. He says, do you think the injury to Spencer and the uncertainty with Max puts more pressure on AA to bring a top-tier starter next season, next offseason, and maybe a trade at the deadline? Whether... I mean, I do think it puts more pressure on on Alex Anthopoulos. With Spencer Strider not getting full-blown Tommy John, if you feel confident that he is going to be back at, you know, really some point next year, and I, th I guess even with Tommy John, you would expect him back at some point next year. But especially if you think you're going to get him back earlier in the season and you feel pretty confident that he can get back to something like Spencer Strider, which I think is a Pretty big ass taking a year off going through major surgery. You see what the Dodgers have done with, with Walker Bueller, basically just delaying his start to the season to limit his innings, making sure he gets plenty of time. Of course, he's coming off a second Tommy John surgery. I think that takes some pressure off because then you have Spencer Strider, you have Chris Sale, you have potentially Ronaldo Lopez, who we'll talk more about today. Then you feel a little bit better about your rotation. There's not as much pressure. I still think there's going to be a need at some point, whether during this season, if you can get somebody with another year of control or during the off season to sign a starting pitcher, who's at least the number three, a mid rotation guy. I just, it's hard for me to see. This is one of those things until Alex Anthopoulos does it. I'm not going to believe it, but it's hard for me to see him going out and signing a, a big free agent starting pitcher. And I don't know what the class looks like at the moment. I know we're coming off a really good class and you saw what happened with those pitchers having to take short deals. If that's the way it's trending and you can sign somebody for a, a short year, you know, three, four year deal at just a higher AAV, I, I want to say that would be more acceptable to Alex Anthopoulos. It's just, you see the state of starting pitching injuries right now. Do you really 
want to sign somebody for five, six years at 25 to 30 million a year, knowing that there's a chance. And at this point, a pretty good chance. There's going to be either be some regression or a year and a half to two years in there that they're just going to be unavailable. It's just so risky. And it always has been, but it feels like especially now to give out any long-term years and dollars to starting pitching. E. Goldie says, congratulations on 10,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for that. Uh, he also said, thank you for all you do to bring the best content to Braves fans. What MLB storyline has surprised you the most through the first few weeks of the season? I, I want to say, because this was one of my picks coming into the year, so maybe it's not a surprise to me, but I like the way the Kansas City Royals are playing. They're pitching really well. And I like Bobby Witt. I know Michael Garcia got off to a hot start, then kind of cooled off. Benny Pasquantino is kind of heating up a little bit. MJ Melendez got off to a hot start. Salvador Perez still there as a veteran who can hit a little bit. I just like that team. I think they're a fun, fun team, and they're one of those those front offices that look they didn't make the splashiest of moves this off season, but did enough bringing in guys you know like Hunter Renfro, kind of building around the foundation that they have there in a winnable division. They've just been a fun team, a team that I, I watch a lot. You know, them, the Pirates, Tigers are three teams I was really was watching coming into the season that I thought, you know, kind of had a little bit of a core, a little bit of something there together that if they got off to a hot start, that perhaps they could have some success. And all three of them are at this point. Um, on the Braves, I mean, it's hard to say what Marcelo Zuna is doing as a surprise, but look, I said there'd be some regression this year and it's, it's early. We're, 15, 16 games into the season, but he looks as good, if not better, than what we saw for, for five months last year. Now, can he keep that up for a full season? We'll see, but I mean, he basically did it for a full season minus a month last year, and now we're seeing him do it in the first month this year. So it's not surprising that he's at least been good, but the fact that he is best one of the best players one of the best hitters in baseball right now i mean i know mlb just put out a top 10 hitters list at the moment i want to say he ranked seventh or eighth on that and i think you make an argument that he deserves to be higher on that list but uh the start that he's gotten off to and just how incredible it's been <laughs> again it, it, it shouldn't be a surprise after what we saw but that at least on the brace brace standpoint is a bit of a surprise to me all right, moving into some other questions from Cavs Buckeyes here. He says, set aside workload concerns. Is there anything in Ronaldo's underlying stats that would have you worried about his long-term performance? Don't think anyone expects a 0.50 ERA, but can he be an all-star level pitcher? Uh, look, there may not be enough pitchers left to field an all-star team with the way injuries are going, but I mean, I think there's certainly a case that he can be an all-star level pitcher. You look at you know, some of the underlying metrics for Ronaldo Lopez, 26.5% strikeout rate. I mean, that is, that's good. That's fine. Um, you know, when he was starting in 2018, 2019, it was around 20%. So that's definitely an improvement there. The 8.8% walk rate. I mean, you can live with that as well. His expected ERA uh, is just a little over two. And I know that's two points higher than what it a uh, point and a half higher, actually, XERA is 2.12. So about a point and a half higher, but that still would be really good. His expected batting average is just 188 or 181. So there's nothing really in the underlying metrics that points to the fact he's going to have a, a regression. Now, the 20.5% sweet spot that he's given up so far, that is well below his career norm. And if that goes up and he's given up some hard hits as well, you look at his uh, you know, average velocity or um, his his barrel percentage or not his barrel percentage. I'm sorry, his average exit velocity of 89.5 percent. That is pretty hard. It ranks in the 38th percentile in all of baseball. If that starts to get added with players getting on the barrel a little bit more, getting on the sweet spot a little bit more, like his career norm, which is typically around 35, 36 percent, and like I said, he's at 20.5 percent, then we definitely could see some regression there, but. I mean the the fastball to me what's been what's been really encouraging is just the command of these pitches. It is dialed back velocity, but the fact that it's still 94, 95, 96 and he's locating it well and that slider has such good movement at 36.1 percent whiff rate on that slider. That's not too far off his 38.7 percent whiff rate he had on that pitch last year as a reliever. 
So the fact he's still getting tons of whip on that slider, the fastball velo has come down. He's not getting the whist on the, on the fastball as much anymore, but he's still locating it well, getting ahead in the count, and then getting the chases on that slider is encouraging. Now, I've said it on here, and I continue to say it. How long can he keep that up? How long can he keep hitters off balance with just those two pitches? That's yet to be seen, but... I mean, I'm not going to tell you he can't until he doesn't. And there's nothing in the underlying data that suggests that he's just gotten completely lucky at this point. So there's no reason to believe he can't continue on this path and be an all-star level starter. Large Lars says, I know he should be, but do you think Michael Harris is as good a number two hitter in the lineup? Seems like he struggles there. I mean, he should be a perfect fit for the number two spot. It's a lefty mixed in between two righties and Ronald and Austin Riley. He has good speed. He typically puts the ball in play. doesn't walk a lot, which is the one, uh, one thing that you want, but you know, neither does Ozzy either. And he fits well in that spot, but you're right. It, it hasn't been the same production 18 for 75. That's a 240 average when batting second, a 279 on base and 16 strikeouts while hitting batting sixth. He has a 376 average 41 for 109 a 404 on base percentage and 17 strikeouts. So he has only one more strikeout batting sixth than he does batting second in 35 more plate appearances. So I don't know what to take from that. I don't know if the mentality for him is changing when he's batting second versus sixth. I don't know if we're dealing with enough of a sample size here, but at least the the numbers and you know it's not it's not a terribly small sample size. We're talking 75 at bats batting and the two spot compared to 109 in the six spot. And the numbers are drastically different. But, I mean, his skill sh- skill set, it should work fine for that two spot. Uh, we just haven't really seen the results there quite yet. All right, we got a lot more questions to get to. Don't know if I'm going to get to all of them here today. If not, I may include them in our, our um, podcast on Friday if we don't get a guest on. But I do have others that I want to answer, and we'll do that here next. Spring training is over. Baseball season is in a full swing. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond to your prize picks entries, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs. Take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. Prize picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks has something for every sports fan out there. If you're into the NBA playoffs, you can pick a game on uh, LeBron. You can pick one on Otani. Pick one on Ronald Acuna Jr. All in the same entry. I was going to check my Prize Picks uh, board out today to see what they have for the Atlanta Braves and Chris Sale on Friday. And you can pick more or less on Chris Sale strikeouts if you think he's going to have a big day against. Going up against the Rangers, you can pick more or less on his strikeout totals and everything else. All you got to do, pick more or less on two to three player categories and whether you think they'll go higher or lower. And they don't have the ones out for Friday yet, so forget everything that I just said. But Friday morning, you can check your prize picks app and see what they have there for Chris Sale strikeouts. And it really just is that simple. Download the app today. Use code LOCKEDONMLB, all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app today. Use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Next question from Matt says, this isn't exactly a Braves question, but the Mets are starting to play well. How concerned are you about them as a threat in the division? Confidence and momentum can carry teams a long way. They seem to be playing carefree. Their pitching is also delivering shockingly. I discussed this with Ryan when I did the crossover podcast with him. I think the Mets, they feel like that team that was supposed to do it one year. You know, they had all the big players, the big payroll. They still have the big payroll. Didn't get it done. But then the next year, they kind of just rally around each other. They put all that behind them. The expectations are off and they just play good baseball. I feel like that could be happening with the Mets here. Also, don't think they've had the hardest schedule uh, to begin the year. But obviously they played the Braves and they played well in that series and got going. Um, So I think they can be a playoff team, certainly. After the Braves, they played the Royals and Pirates who have gotten off to good starts. But, you know, certainly teams I think most people would have expected the Mets to beat even coming into the season. 
Uh, and they went five and one on that trip. The Braves went five and one on a road trip to Miami, who made the postseason last year, obviously off to a bad start, and the Astros, who are struggling early as well. So, I, I mean, they do, they're coming up against the Dodgers next, and they go to the San Francisco. We'll see how they do in those two series. But I think the Mets are a good enough team still that they can play 500 baseball, and that's really all you got to do in today's postseason format to get in. So I think there's certainly a chance there, and I think there is something, like I said, to that that year after the year. All the expectations off the Mets, I can see them making a good run this year. But a lot will come down to that pitching, how healthy it can be, and how effective some of those guys can be. Manaya, Severino, some of those reclamation projects. Can Kodai Singa get back healthy? Can Christian Scott come up and perform like he has at the minor league level? If that all happens and clicks, I can definitely see the Mets getting in the postseason. I don't know that they'll be a threat for the division, uh, but certainly a wild card team. Another one from Cass Buckeyes is Arcia just an above average MLB regular now. I expected some regression. Instead, he's gone the other way. Like last year, I assume he'll cool off, but it's pretty wild mid-career leap. His defense has also seemingly improved. I mean, my my view on Arcia hasn't really changed all that much since he got the starting job i said then he'll be fine and he won't hurt the braves he was great he was an all-star in the first half of last year and then he was below average in the second half and now to begin this year he looks like an all-star again we'll see if he can have a full year of it it's not like this is some old mid-30s guy he's been around for a long time because he came up so young with the brewers he's still just 29 so there's certainly the possibility that he's having his best years, that he's in his prime seasons, and he's you know living that out. I do think at the end of the day, I think he's somebody that's going to be average to maybe slightly below average offensively and somebody who's average to slightly above average defensively, which gives you an, an average, maybe slightly above average MLB regular. And I think that's absolutely fine for what the Braves need. I'd love to see him continue this all-star run that he had at the beginning of last year and the start to this year for a full season and completely make me eat these words, but just hard to imagine that he suddenly has become an all-star level player at this point in his career. Like I said, not like it's late in his career, but uh, that would be quite the mid-career leap, as Kaz Buckeyes said. A couple from Bellfire. It sounds wild given how bad his two years were before last season, but at what point do you think Ozuna will start getting extension talks? Will it take a full 2024 season of consistent play like he has been doing, or has he shown enough already to merit one? That's a good question. Um, the Braves do have a team option on him for $16 million for next year, so there's nothing that needs to be done right now for Marcelo Ozuna. The way he's playing right now, as long as he stays healthy and keeps it up, that option seems like a no-brainer at this point. Now, do you talk about extending that a year, and can you still get him for $18, 20000000 million? Again, the team option for next year is just $16 million. That's That's a no-brainer. Ah. Look, the, the takes on Ozuna are going to be all over the place because of his, his past history off the field. I am one of those that said the Braves should just, just cut him. I think what he did was – inexcusable. I know some people say it was nothing. It was minor. I am not of that group. He has seemed to put that in his past. All indications from clubhouse teammates say that he is he has turned it around, that he is a, a good guy in the clubhouse. I don't know. I'm not in his everyday life, but I think that has to be in consideration if you're thinking about extending a guy who has the past off the bill that he has. And again, that seemingly all seems to be behind him. But I would hope that would factor in to what the Braves' decision has become. You know, like he went through the rehabilitation process for anger management and all of that. And again, I, I pray that that is the case, that he has put that behind him. He is a change reform man. That can happen. We all have the ability to, to, to be better, to put our past behind us. We all deserve second chances more than anything than on the field. I hope that is the case for Ozuna. If that is the case and the Braves believe that, Certainly what he's done on the field has warranted a discussion to keep him around longer. Now, he is a DH, and if the bat suddenly goes away, he cannot play in the field. And if the bat suddenly goes away, and it's like it was the two previous years before 2023, then you're stuck with a, an 18 20 $22 million player, whatever it's going to cost, and you get nothing, essentially nothing out of it. I, I would not go too far with Marcelo Zuna. It's just I can't get over – Partially what happened off the field, but also what happened on the field for 2021 and 2022. Those are still just very, 
fresh on my mind and it's it's hard for me to put that out but again if the off the field stuff is cleaned up and he is a reformed man and well, obviously he's reformed on the field he's a great guy in the clubhouse from all indications from listening to the other players he has definitely earned that opportunity to entertain those discussions and we'll see if the Braves have them last question here from Bellfire I know there's several I'm going to miss I promise I will get to those in another episode but last one here from Bellfire a couple weeks into the season you're you're Alex Anthopoulos what positions are you keeping for an eye on for potential trade deadline additions knowing what you know so far obviously starting rotation you lose Spencer Strider look you're not going to replace that but you'd love to get another arm in there in case you lose somebody else. And we've seen that with the Braves the last two postseasons. They lost a couple of arms going in into the postseason. They got Chris Sale this year. They kind of give you some of that depth, but it's so early in the season. I mean, there's a good chance, a real chance that you lose somebody else. So I'm keeping my eye on some. I don't think you're going to find a top of the rotation arm. I don't know if the Braves have the the prospect capital to go out and, and compete to get the best arms on the market at the deadline. But I am certainly looking for some mid rotation Jordan Montgomery type of moves to be made at the deadline to help just improve the depth. So that's number one for me. You're always looking for bullpen depth. I know the Braves bullpen is so deep right now and looks so good, but things can change quickly in a bullpen. I don't know that I'm looking for anything offensively unless there are some major injuries. I think you let left field just play itself out this year. See what happens with Kelnick and Duvall. Early returns, I think it looks pretty good. But I don't think there's anything. Obviously, you're going to try to make some moves on the bench as well. I uh, wouldn't be surprised they look to to get a big left-handed bat off the bench. But you just don't use the bench that much. So starting rotation, adding some at least mid-rotation depth there. Always looking for some bullpen help and then maybe a bench bat. That's Those are the three areas that I would be looking at right now. All right, that would do for this episode of Locked on Braves. Again, sorry for the questions that I missed. I will get to those, I promise you. Make sure you subscribe to Locked on Braves wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.